Well, unfortunately, there's not exactly a lot of skip coming in today. Of course, yesterday. A little bit. Now you can see even even the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's not Super Bowl one. Okay, so anyhow, what we have on the bench today is a Courier 23. This is by ECI. Uh, that was before it was uh, Courier Fannin. Uh, used to be ECI, actually ECI Courier. And this is the model Courier 23. So this is one of the really early radios. Um, they made all kinds of radios just like Lafayette and most of the other companies back in the tube type days. Had lots of different versions, but this is a very early one. Um, actually, this is in, sitting over there, it's in Sam's Manual number 8, which came out in August of 1965, and this radio came out obviously before that. Um, actually, I have to, give me just a second. Always, always amazes me how much, you know, if you think about how much these radios cost <laughs> back when they were brand new, Back in that time, radios like this, this was a luxury item. Nowadays, people consider a CB radio, ah, yeah, I'll just buy one of those at the end of the week when I get my paycheck. Yeah, back in the day, you didn't just get your paycheck and, yeah, I'll go buy a CB radio because they were crazy expensive back then. And I think, let's see here, I'm trying to find the original sales literature. Oh, where in the heck is it? Da, da, da. Courier, Courier, Courier 23. There it is. So let me just have a look. See here, I'm on looking on a computer. Okay, a uh, hundred and eighty-nine dollars and fifty cents. Slightly higher in the Rocky, west of the Rockies. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, 23 channel dual conversion transistor power supply. Um, Includes all crisp, all crystals, mounting brackets, power cord, and noise canceling microphone. But yeah, hundred and eighty nine dollars and fifty cents, slightly higher west of the Rockies, and that was in uh, when did that advertisement come out? Uh, no date on that one. September nineteen sixty four. <laughs> so yeah, September of nineteen sixty four. This radio was basically one hundred and ninety bucks. That's how much that cost. So yeah, go go hit the inflation calculator and see how much that costs nowadays. You probably got to be getting close to I don't know what a thousand nine hundred a thousand dollars. I would think converted to today's money. You know, accounting for inflation over the decades. But uh, yeah, like I say, radios back. Back in the day, these were luxury items. You didn't just willy-nilly go buy, ah, I'll go get another one this week. I mean, unless, unless you were rich. Um, you know, electronics like CB radios, even just regular AM radios, uh, you know, and eventually AM, FM radios, and televisions and whatnot. Those were things you planned for. So, in any case, customer sent this one in to have it uh, restored. Um, actually, this radio doesn't belong to him. He sent in a couple things. Um, this actually belongs to a friend of his. But uh, I think this was his father's radio, possibly. It's something like that. It's a, It's got some family history there. Um, so just wanted it restored, back up and working for, you know, the least amount of money. Didn't want to go investing a huge amount of money into the thing, but did want it to work. So um, now anytime I get something like this in, I don't even turn it on. Yeah, a lot of people say, well, you could bring it up slowly on a Variac and see whether it works. Nope, not going to do it. I'm going to change the electrolytic capacitors anyhow. going to change the high wattage resistors. Why would I waste my time turning it on, spending 15 minutes, a half hour, an hour or more, waiting for the capacitors to reform partially just so I can replace them anyhow? Big waste of time. Change the caps change those high wattage resistors right out of the box, then I can just fire it up. I don't have to bring it up slowly on a Variac transformer. The parts that are going to go pop if you just plug it in and turn it on are the electrolytic capacitors. Well, they're brand new, so they're not going to pop. Uh, you know, and some people, I I've occasionally get people question me, oh, it's a waste of money changing electrolytic caps. No, it's not. I don't know how many times do I have to say this. That is the one part in 
any radio, in, not just radio, the elect, aluminum electrolytic capacitors in anything electronic. If it plugs into a wall, runs off batteries, runs off solar power, I don't care what it is, but if it's an aluminum electrolytic capacitor, it's going to go bad. They have a life expectancy. Once you exceed that life expectancy, it's not like there's an on-off switch, and once it exceeds its, you know, manufacturer's published data sheet, life expectancy. It's not like there's an on-off switch and it just works one day and well, it reached that date and stops working. No, that's like the minimum time, you know, you're guaranteed to get use out of out of the part. But after that time, they're pretty much guaranteed to be starting to degrade. It's just the natural process of aluminum electrolytic capacitors. They degrade over time. It's just the chemistry, the electrolyte that's in there, the paper that separates them. The aluminum starts to oxidize, starts to punch little holes through the paper. You start to get shorts in between the plates in there, and eventually they get hot enough because you're basically all you're doing over time is that capacitor's turning from a capacitor into a resistor. And what do resistors do? Resistors get hot. And, if, and that's why capacitors will eventually explode, usually, especially high voltage caps. Um, and as, if you get something like this, or if you have an old radio, it's been sitting in an attic, or out in your garage, or down in your basement, or actually even on your you know, living room shelf, let's say, you've had something old like this that's been sitting for you know, decades, honestly, don't plug it in and just turn it on. It's very, very likely you might hear a loud pop or explosion. Uh, it's not actually smoke you're seeing. It's actually, well, there'll be a little bit, I guess, arcing smoke, but most of it's going to be steam, and that's going to be any of the remainder of the electrolyte that was still in the electrolytic capacitor has vaporized into a steam. But that is a disaster. If you've ever had to replace electrolytic capacitors in something like this after they have exploded, it's a pain in the butt. Because when they explode, you know, capacitors like this, when they explode, usually this, this end, the plug-in, because one end solid aluminum, it's like basically a can, and then a little phenolic board with a rubber sealing on there goes in. But this whole end blows out, along with everything that's in here, which is just two sheets of aluminum foil separated by a sheet of paper impregnated with electrolyte. Well, that blows up, and it comes out in tiny little fragments. It's like a miniature hand grenade going off. And of course, what's aluminum? It's conductive. Well, you got to get all those little tiny metal fragments out from the underside of this thing, because that crap will just go <laughs> everywhere on the underside. So, yeah, that's why I don't even bother powering stuff up. Just replace the caps. This one is bad. I can just physically look at it and see. There's the vent hole hidden underneath the rubber there, but it's starting to leak out. And we can actually check some of these caps on the on a capacitor analyzer, and I can show you they're bad. Um, this also needed a couple tubes, uh, replaced what, one, two, three tubes, so three of the vacuum tubes got changed. Um, did need a couple crystals too, there were actually less than half of the channels on this radio worked. Now fortunately, this is not an extremely early CB radio. So this does not have separate crystals for transmit and receive. Uh, this is a very early crystal mixed radio, so it has two sets of crystals, those frequencies get mixed together in different combinations to make up each of the channels. But this radio has all 23, actually it has 24 channels. I'm not sure how the laws wasn't even alive in 1965, so I honestly don't know. It's one of those things, historically, I just have to, I'd have to look it up. But remember there's a missing channel, you, you, when you go from 22... To 23 this radio now most radios will have a PA position there a lot of radios you'll see back in the tube days the channel selector switch would go 22 PA 23 22a actually works in this radio and looking at the schematic it was wired to work I how did they get away with that back then you know how did they release a radio that actually I didn't check to see Yep, it transmits. It does transmit on, on, on that channel. But yeah, it will receive and transmit on channel 22 on the A channel. Ah, <laughs> I've never really tried that. I just out of curiosity. Because there's not a lot of radios that have that on the channel indicator. 22A. Like I say, usually that's uh, PA. But uh, this one was in decent condition. I wouldn't say it was in anywhere close to good condition. The cover looked like death warmed over. I mean, it's it, but it's a lot better now. 
So one of the things they wanted to know if I could do, was there anything I could do to rescue the cover because it was so pitted and just dirty and nasty. And yes, it's actually cleaned up rather well. So uh, just a little bit of work on the uh, Baldor buffer. Actually, I did uh, before I buffed it. And it's actually a suggestion. If you ever have old chrome covers like that, you'll have just... Honestly, there's probably tens of thousands of little microscopic pits in the chrome, and they're starting to rust, okay? That blooms out, and it looks really nasty. Getting that off with just a buffer, honestly, a lot of times is, is kind of hard. You'll, I mean, you can do it with a buffer, depending on what compound you're using, but there's a faster way to get it off more efficiently. That's a brass wire wheel. That's what I use. I have another Baldor buffer set up with a brand. Then they're not cheap now, but if you do this, you know, that kind of stuff for a living. Um, I have found that the brass wire wheels have really fine bristles. Oh my god, it's, it's just, it makes short work of stuff like that. You just run that cover underneath of a brass wire wheel, all those little rust pits just disappear. Then you can take it over, hit it on the, hit it on the, the, the actual buffer, and uh, like I say, it turned out really nice. Got some a little bit of chrome wear through down to the nickel plating in uh, one spot along the front. But other than that, it actually looks really good. Um, the knobs, oh my god. These are solid aluminum knobs. So a billet of aluminum or a piece of bar stock that was machined out into these knobs and then had the, the finger grooves cut into them. The problem is those knobs are, the, the hole in the, in the back of those is so close to the size of the shaft of the either the channel selector shaft or the you know the controls here uh just and what does ox aluminum do it oxidizes and that's these things were very oxidized and really dirty especially in these grooved areas here so i needed to get them off to try to clean them up at least a little bit i had honestly probably 15 or 20 minutes just removing the knobs that's it nothing else other than just getting the knobs off i think these two came off fine this one and this one i ended up having to soak with some uh Kano Croil, uh, it's a penetrating lubricant. Works really well. Been using it for decades. Um, this one I was eventually able to just get pulled off, but this one I actually had to pry off. And he, well, actually I got it started, and then I could turn it a little bit. It was actually spinning on the shaft, but it was still stuck. It wouldn't come off. So yeah, I just sat there for like five minutes, basically just spinning it, wear, basically wearing out the aluminum on the shaft because uh, the the shaft coming well, actually the shaft coming out of the channel selector switch is steel, and of course the knobs aluminum. So but it's slowly basically wearing the hole out a little bit to break up that oxidation I was eventually able to get that one off but whew, boy that was a that was a challenge getting those things off so uh, inside like I say this one was not in mint condition um, these radios have a copper plated steel chassis so it's just a thin plating of copper on there uh, they mainly did that I think because on the bottom side of these Basically, anytime they needed a ground, they just soldered to the chassis. And, of course, it's a lot easier to solder to copper-plated steel than it is to bare steel. If you're soldering to bare steel, of course, you need to be using acid core or acid flux to, uh, you know, get a good connection. So, by copper plating it, you could just normal use normal rosin flux when you're soldering anything, you know, any of the terminal strips or any time you need a ground you can just lay the lead on the chassis hit it with a big solder and iron and it'll stick really easily but yeah it kind of oxidizes and corrodes over the years um i'm not going to say it's hopeless could you restore that and it was dirty before this is actually after it's been clean so what you're seeing is actually about as clean as you're going to get could it be made better yes you could make that polished flawless looking copper but you'd be looking at probably four figures to do that. Because honestly, you the only way you could do that would be completely strip the entire chassis. Remove every component out of this radio. Take this chassis, strip it, buff it, and polish it. Copper plate it, and then buff it, and reassemble the radio. You would have days just in that. Yeah, it would, it would be just insanely expensive to even attempt to try to do something like that. But uh, so, like I say, I cleaned it up. Just applied a light coat of oil, uh, corrosion preventing oil, to it to clean it up um, and prevent it from you know oxidizing any farther. Um, there's a little bit of an empty hole over here. There actually used to be. Actually, that's where this capacitor used to live. It used to be right down in there. I used a smaller one, and it's now on the mounted on the bottom side. So actually, let me just uh, another thing, just of note. Occasionally, I'll get people ask me. They'll buy an old radio, turn it on, and say, I don't hear anything. And I've got the squelch turned down the whole way. 
Well, if you have the squelch turned down the whole way, yeah, you're not going to hear anything. Don't ask me why. Early CB radios, the majority of them, you can see the volumes turned up there. But the majority of early CB radios, the squelch operates backwards. When it's full counterclockwise, that's maximum squelch. If you turn it up the whole way full clockwise, that's no squelch. So, yeah. <laughs> Other thing with this radio, it has two controls. This one is an on-off switch, as is this one. So they have both have uh, on-off position. This one's marked standby, and this one's marked on-off. So if you put this in the standby position, but the radio's still turned on, you'll see the light bulb's on, and all of the tube filaments are on, but there's no high voltage. Once you turn, and you, yeah, you turn the volume up, there's absolutely no sound there at all. Then again, the control's full counterclockwise. But yeah, the radio effectively is off. Basically, the only thing that's still active in this is the low voltage circuit for the uh, the wind or for the, the light bulbs and for the uh, filaments. So you know you could turn this to the on position. Got to remember it's an old tube radio. It takes it a little while to warm up. You know, walk out of the room, come back, and then you could just flick this button. Remember, turn your turn your squelch control full counter or full clockwise. And then you'll, it'll be basically instant on. And actually, that was a, I think, I don't think that was Courier, was it? Was that Robin? I think they trademarked, or, you know, it was their little trade. They called that in, the instant on feature. And honestly, a lot of your early radios like this had that. They had that dual control. They had an on-off, and they had a standby mode, which disabled the high voltage. And when you turn, turn that on, it then actually... The entire radio would come on. But yeah, I think Robin called that the instant on feature. <laughs> um, another thing I did was uh, made up a uh, microphone adapter for this. So to a normal four pin. And then this has, because this has the old, now the customer asked, could I stick a four pin mic jack in there? Now it does have a four pin mic jack. It just happens to be, actually, compare the sizes here. <laughs> You can see how much bigger the old 4-pin mic jacks were. But anyhow, he asked if I could stick basically one of these in there. Yeah, yeah you can, but honestly, when you do that, it looks like hell. Um, you ruin the looks of the radio. The problem is the hole is huge because it's a huge microphone connector. So, yeah, it's it's not advisable. I've seen people do it. You, you know, they make up a flat washer and some stuff to try and do it. And yeah, it works, but, you know, I usually suggest as, as long as the jack is okay and you have a microphone plug, I mean, you can still get these things. They're not cheap. They're like 20, high $20, uh, these old Amphenol plugs like this. But, uh, you know, as long as the jack's good and you've got a plug, just make up an adapter cable, you know, or just put the... Just put the cord, you know, if you've got one microphone you know you're going to be using the radio with, just put the plug on the end of that microphone. Um, so, get her turned off here. So, like I say, that turns off the high voltage, that turns off the entire radio. And if you leave this in the standby position and then turn it on, that just basically turns everything on at the same time. So, you know, if you only ever wanted to have to turn off one control, turn off, or not that one, turn off the... You know, you could leave the squelch turned up and just turn it off. That kills the radio. Even though the standby is in the on position, the radio is still completely off. Like I say, like the only thing that does is disable the high voltage, but this control has to be on for there to be any high voltage. So, yeah, if you want to just use one control, use the volume on-off. And you can see, there's no sound. You're going to have to wait for the tubes to warm back up again. But, uh... The power cord unplugged. Just get her flipped over here really quick. And there's the underside. So, like I say, all the uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors were replaced. To work, uh, what I think only one, maybe two. Got to look over here in the parts bin. Two. Yeah, there were two. Uh, old paper caps right here. So both of those were replaced. A um, bunch of uh, uh, resistors were replaced in here. Uh, you know, 
the high wattage ones, and then there were a bunch of small, the small, usually you don't have to replace many low wattage resistors, but actually in this one there were several of uh, the low wattage resistors had drifted out of tolerance, so all of those were replaced as well. Other than that, everything on the underside was in pretty good condition. Uh, both of these crystals were good. These are oscillator crystals here that are used in all modes, receive and transmit. Both of those were okay. Um, so let me get the uh, cover put back on this thing and you can uh, see what she looks like once it's uh, all together. Oh, one last thing. Um, if you own one of these, <laughs> there is a potentiometer on the back of these. It's labeled, uh, I think, meter adjust. Yeah, meter AD, ADJ, so meter adjust. That is for adjusting the meter. You could probably say in one of these radios the metering circuit is, what's the word I should use? Archaic? <laughs> it's not very well thought out, honestly. Yeah, I think it was almost an afterthought. They built the radio and somebody went, oh crap, we got a meter and we forgot to hook it up in the radio. And the system that they came up with, you are never going to get this meter to read correctly at S9 and the needle be on zero or if you adjust the meter so it's when there's no incoming signal so the needles on zero when you wouldn't shove a an S9 signal level into this thing it's only going to be at like I think S5 or S6 or something like that if you adjust the meter you know if you inject uh, minus 73 dBm into it and adjust it for S9 at full scale well then when you take the signal away with no incoming signal into the radio, it stuck at like S3 or something. Yeah, it just, yeah, it, not, a, not a very well thought out metering circuit. <laughs> um, and honestly, most of your old tube radios like this, the early ones, it really was just relative. It was just looking at it and seeing, yeah, okay, yeah, your the needle's moved up, so yeah, your signal's kind of strong. It's, it's early. It's primitive. That's probably the best way to put it. It's primitive. <laughs> it's a very primitive metering circuit. Um, now this radio will operate off of uh, 12 or uh, 12 volts or 120, depending on you know the power plug. Remember these have the old octal plug. So this is the 120 volt power cord. You could make up a 12 volt cord, and then that's actually when the uh, the transistors back here in this transformer actually come into play is when you're using a uh, low voltage. So let me get her put back together and take a look at it and see what she looks like together. So here she is all back together now. Yeah, it looks like the skip's just starting to come in this afternoon. <laughs> Bowl still dead. Yeah, even 11. Very only a couple people coming through, even on 11. So, in any case, there's the radio, and like I said, I'll show you the. Uh, oh, and the wear on the chrome. Right there, it's rubbed through, so I don't know if someone laid their hand up here a lot or what, but yeah, there seems to be a lot of wear in the chrome right at the back edge of this front strip, so I'm not sure what the heck happened there. You can even see the discoloration. Looks like it's actually worn through the chrome plating, and it's down to the nickel plating there. But the, yeah, the cover definitely looks a lot better than it did. Um, so all the parts that were replaced, like I say, a couple tubes... There's the old ones, and then the normal stuff, electrolytic capacitors and a bunch of resistors. Did stick a new light bulb in there. Um, now the caps. That's what we wanted to check. I'll just show you that what I mean by, and there's even a little guy there. Aren't exactly a lot. Oh, and this thing here, <laughs> yeah, this had to go. They had this wrapped around. <laughs> there's two different sizes of crystals used in this radio depending on which bank they are of the, of the mixing crystals. The small ones are attached to the channel selector switch and just basically hang off of it. Well actually these do too. But there's four of these larger style crystals that were shoved down in this piece of plastic tubing. And I don't know what this is. You see this stuff occasionally in old radios. Just old electronics. Whatever this was they used. Um, I guess it was an early heat shrink tubing. I'm not sure or if it came already this size and they just shoved it on. But yeah, you can see how corrosive this stuff is. These crystals, I actually had to clean all this one off because I got 
there's still residue of it on there. I just wiped it off, but yet it's, it's ugh, it just causes corrosion. And there's actually some wires. You'll even notice in old radios, uh, what is that, the black insulation, or is that the yellow? One of the wire colors in old radios, that insulation, you know, the actual insulation on the wire, actually becomes, again, just mildly corrosive, and you'll see green ooze, just goop, like this, running out of the end of your wires. That's normal. That's I mean, it's not good, but it's also, it's just normal. There's some some chemical in there that just is, I guess, as it decomposes over the years, becomes corrosive, and yeah. So, yeah, anytime I see this stuff, I always remove it. Um, so, the capacitors, let's just, uh, let's see, power strip's already on there. So, let's check, let's say, like this one here. This is a 40 microfarad at 350 volts. Come on, get on there, little guy. And... Yeah, immediately I see a big problem. Point, not, not, that's not 340, that's point. There's actually a decimal point right there. Point, 344 microfarads. Yeah, that's really, really low. <laughs> uh, let's see, it's on 100 volts for leakage. Yeah, yeah, 4,000. We turn it up to 300 volts. This was, what, 350 volt cap, so yeah, we'll go to 300 volts. Yeah, 8,000, it's actually going up. Usually it'll drop down if it starts to reform a little bit. Yeah, 8,700 and something. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> it's toast. For starters, like I said, I get the feeling it's barely even making contact in there. But yeah, it's a 40 microfarad capacitor that measures 0.34. <laughs> um, let's check one of these. So, anytime you see these, uh, this... Now... One thing to remember when testing for leakage on electrolytic capacitors, all electrolytic capacitors have leakage. There is an allowed amount of, of leakage in an electrolytic capacitor. If you buy a brand new one, don't care how high quality it is, but if it's you know, this style aluminum electrolytic capacitor, they have leakage. That's just the nature of this style capacitor. But there's an acceptable level. And once you get over that, the problem is that leakage that's being burned up as heat in here, and that's why they eventually blow up. But this style capacitor, this is basically the only thing. You know, this one, this stuff like this, ones like this, even the radials that you change in more modern radios, those have an allowable amount of leakage, but it shouldn't be excessive. Um, so actually, let's check this little guy here. This is a, what is this, 10 microfarad at 30 volts. And we'll just stick that on 25. Nothing. Yeah, it has no capacitance. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's probably open internally. And leakage... Yeah, it also has absolutely no leakage whatsoever, which is, as I just said, all aluminum electrolytic capacitors have leakage. So yeah, this one's actually so bad, the lead has apparently just oxidized off the end of the, the foil. It's not, this little terminal's not actually attached to anything inside, it's just oxidized off. Um, actually, there's only one section here that doesn't have anything attached to it, that's that one. And that is what, the square which is 30 microfarads at 450 volts for the square. Where was that? Right there. I'll stay on there. So 40 microfarads at 350 volts. Eh, fall over. See if I care. <laughs> so we'll just stick it at 100 to start with. So... Yeah, it measures really, really high, for starters. 61, and decreasing. Yeah, the capacitance is changing. 60.6, <laughs> 0 0.7, yeah, it can't make up its mind. And leakage, even at 100 volts, yeah, it's exceeding 10,000 microamps, because that's, that's basically what that is. Anytime it gets above 10,000 microamps, the display just flashes. So, yeah, it's just horribly leaky. And that's at only 100 volts. I haven't even turned it up to, like, you know, 200, 300, or 400 volts. So, yeah. Again, the can cap's bad.
Now, let's check one of these. These, well actually there is one more electrolytic here. This is what, 25 at 50. Let's see what this one is. Yeah, 5.2 picofarads. Not microfarads like it's supposed to be. The little LEDs on the upper scale there. Yeah, 5 picofarads. Leakage, again, nothing. So, yeah, that's a good indication that this capacitor, this terminal, is actually not attached to anything inside anymore. It's, it's just oxidized off. It's, again, an open capacitor. It's not doing anything. Um, and we'll check one of these wax types here. Now, these are allowed leakage, brand new. But this is the only style of capacitor you should ever see leakage on. If you have anything else, it can be mica, paper, poly, it doesn't matter what type. All other styles of capacitors should not show leakage. Now they'll show an initial leakage current. Anytime you energize any capacitor, even if it's not an electrolytic capacitor, there'll be an initial current draw as the capacitor charges up, but once it reaches that, the current draw should drop down to zero. There should be no leakage. So this one's rated at 0.1 microfarad at 400 volts. Remember, this is a non-polarized capacitor. Even though it has a band here, that's just indicating the outer foil for shielding. It's not actually a polarity marking. So we'll just stick this up to 400 volts. And remember, this, this capacitor analyzer is actually applying 400 volts, whatever voltage rating you put it on there. So it reads 0.135 microfarads. So it's, what, 35 to, yeah, flutter into 36. So it's like 35% high, and leakage, yes, it does have leakage, 10 microamps. Now that's very low, well, it's actually going up, 30, 20, 30, <laughs> back down to 10, can't make up its mind. Yeah, so obviously that capacitor is starting to go bad, like I say. Any, anything other than an aluminum electrolytic should have absolutely no leakage. So again, bad cap. And that's why I don't power radios up when they first show up. You know, any of these could have just possibly gone kapoof. It's obviously bad. <laughs> Physically, you can see them leaking externally and electrically tested they were bad. So that's why I don't power radios up. Get an old radio like that, just replace the caps and resistors first, and then move on. Actually, this one's a rattle. If you can hear that or not. Sounds like the tar is starting to break loose in that one. <laughs> so, in any case, there you go. There's a Courier 23. Um, I wouldn't call this a complete uh, restoration because there's a lot more that could be done to this to make it look even better and whatnot. But, yeah, finance, to keep it financially practical, yeah, this is, a, this is about all you can do for it without get, starting to get insane in the price of, you know, actually having to restore this thing. Um, and it looks a lot better. Like I say, this cover was just nasty. It was basically brown. It was, it, it, it did not look good at all. I wish I'd have shot some footage of that before I actually started to show you how bad it was. But you've probably seen me do other radios like this that had chrome covers and seen the comparison of before and after with them. Like I say, it's impressive what you can do with a with a power buffer. <laughs> and like I say, if you do a lot of the a lot of things like this, it doesn't need to be a radio cover shoot, it can be a chrome bumpers on cars. But I have found that uh, very fine bristle brass brushes on on a buff, buffing machine, you know, I'm using a 10 inch buffing that's a or a 10 inch wire wheel and it's like two inches wide. It's a really big wheel. But uh, man, they just do it makes doing this kind of stuff so fast. The brass is too soft to damage the chrome plating, but it gets rid of all those little rust pits or, you know, wipes off the rust. And it's also great for removing dirt and grime, uh, which is actually one thing you'll run into with old radio covers like this. Remember, this is tube type, so once this thing's been on for like 10-15 minutes, this cover is hot. So any atmospheric gunk that gets on this thing over the decades has been baked onto this chrome. You can scrub with, I don't care what cleaner you use, for an hour and it just won't come off. It is burnt on. It's almost like an you know, like your barbecue grill, trying to get that black grunge off of a barbecue grill. Yeah, other than scraping, it just it just can't you just can't get the damn stuff off. Um, those brass wire wheels, whoop, it's gone. 
it takes the rust pits off and that dirt just vanishes because it's really hard and crunchy. So it, But it's softer than the brass. But like I say, the brass is softer than the chrome. So it doesn't damage the chrome, but it can remove all that other, all the other contaminants that are softer than the brass bristles themselves. So that's just a little tip. If you do a lot of chrome polishing, brass wire wheels are really, really handy for speeding up the uh, cleaning and buffing process. So there you go. There's an ECI Courier 23 ready to be sent back and put on the air. And I think uh, he said this customer, their local group, because remember, 23 Channel Radio, um, his local group is Channel 22, so perfect radio. It it goes up to you know Channel 22, so yeah, you don't need a 40 channel radio a lot of times. The old even an old single channel radio, as long as you have a set of crystals for like an old really old CB radio, as long as you have the crystals to talk on the channel you want to talk on, you don't need a radio with a lot of channels. Just as long as you have. The capability of talking on the actual channels you want. So if it's an old three or four channel radio and you want to, there's two or three channels you talk on all the time, you get sets of crystals for those channels, just like the people used to do back in the day, you know, because you were limited by how many sets of crystals you could stick in a radio before radios like this came out with crystal mixing. Um, and, you know, that was, that was just how radios worked back in the early days. So anyhow, there you go. Thought I'd show that one because uh, don't you don't see a lot of these anymore. Like I say, this is a really early courier, so there you go.